Hey there, interactive developers. Jack Delora here with the Interactive and Immersive HQ. In this video, we're going to take a look at sending some OSC messages from Touch Designer to Unreal Engine. We're going to load in a very cool test file that is a model of a uh, New York City subway car, and then we're going to route some very simple chop channel messages via OSC to Unreal Engine to control the uh, overhead lighting in that subway car. So this is going to be a great example for how you can start to integrate these two tools and uh, for how you can set up Unreal to receive these kinds of messages and then route that information to uh, anything you like. So uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun, stick around, we're going to jump right into it. So step one of our process today is to install Unreal Engine if you don't have it installed already. So head to unrealengine.com and then click on the download link in the upper right. That'll take you to this page here, which kind of gives you an overview of the specs and the licensing and all that stuff. Um, what you're going to do is to download the Epic Games Launcher, which then allows you to install the Unreal Engine from there. One thing to note is that the Unreal Engine installer is something like 50 gigs or more. So depending on your internet connection, this might take a little while to download and set up. So here is the Epic Games Launcher. Once you have uh, downloaded it and installed it on your machine, here's what it looks like on Windows. And you can see here we have the ability to um, click on this Unreal Engine section which then allows us to install a particular version of the engine. I'm gonna be using 5.1.1 for this tutorial, but you're welcome to use an earlier version if you want to. Uh, the kind of stuff that we're doing today, it's not really critical which version of the software you're using, so long as it is compatible with the demo scene that we're going to be using. Another thing you'll notice is that the Unreal Engine section here has its own marketplace, and that is where we're going to download the demo content that we're gonna be using for our project. So once you have uh, gone to the marketplace, this is going to be found under the free section, or we can search the products here on the right. So what I'm gonna do is type in Subway and hit enter and you will see a bunch of different options here, but we're looking for a free one. So I'm gonna click free, and it is this one here called City Subway Train Modular. So you'll click on this, and then uh, it'll give you the ability basically to add this to cart. It's free, so you don't have to set up any sort of uh, credit card or anything like that. You'll want to download that and then create a project with this particular scene. So I'm going to go ahead and create a project along with you. I'm gonna click the create project link and then I'm going to set up a new name for this as well. So I'm gonna do TD underscore OSC underscore test for my project name and I want to make sure that I'm using the Unreal Engine version that I want, which is 5.1 as I mentioned a moment ago. And uh, once we've got that set up, we'll just go ahead and hit create. Um, this will take a couple of moments again if you haven't downloaded this already. And then we will jump in once it is set up. Okay, so you can see in my project section here, I've got a number of things, but all the way on the right is the new TDOSC test project that I just set up. So if I go ahead and double click on that, it will open up for the first time. And this usually involves a bunch of uh, compiling of shaders and setting up the sort of initialized version of the project, which can take uh, quite a long time depending on the project. So um, sit tight if this is, again, the first time you're opening this project, it may be a while before it opens up. As you're waiting for the project to either download or compile for the first time in Unreal, why don't we go ahead and open up Touch Designer at the same time so we can set up the network there. Now this is gonna be super simple for this project because our only goal here is to sort of make this connection between the two pieces of software and send some information over to Unreal for controlling the lights. So to do that, I am going to use a number of chops. Um, basically I'm gonna use the LFO chop as the data source for controlling these lights, and then we'll use a couple of other operators to modify that signal. 
So um, I have added the LFO chop to my network. And then what I'll do is come to the channel page and rename this channel. So uh, what we are going to be using this uh, channel for is the intensity of some of the lights that are in the scene in Unreal. So what I'm gonna do here is actually rename this channel name from Chan1 to intensity and hit enter. Once you've done that, you are free to go ahead and play around with the settings. Um, you're not going to be able to see what they are uh, impacting in the scene yet. So I'm going to leave them at their kind of default. And then once I've made the connection later on, I'll kind of tweak those to something a little bit more interesting. The other thing that I'm going to do is to add a math chop after the LFO. I'm gonna use this to change the output range. Now, the intensity of the light in Unreal that we're gonna be controlling uh, expects a, a range that is much larger than the um, kind of negative one to positive one range that we're seeing here. It might be uh, in lumens or something like that. So what I'm gonna do with this math chop is to change the range of this uh, chop channel. So I'm gonna go to the range page and change the from range to fall between negative one and positive one. And then in the to range, I'm going to set the uh, lower bound to zero and the upper bound to 5,800. Again, those seem kind of arbitrary, but as we'll see when we get into Unreal, that is kind of a normal-ish value for the intensity value in that program. Now, of course, we could modify the uh, control signals in Unreal as well, but um, it's very easy for us to add a math chop now, so that's why I'm doing that. After that, I'll add a null because, of course, we want the ability to um, be able to you know, play around with this signal. We can add different chops to modify it or even replace the LFO with something else later on. And then what I'm going to do is add the OSC out chop. This is a super handy chop that will send out OSC messages as our chop channels change. And uh, within this one, we're actually just gonna kind of leave everything as it is and use these settings to, uh, or, or rather match these settings for our OSC server that we're going to set up in our Unreal project. So let's head back to Unreal and start looking at our project here. So we have this scene, which is again, this uh, sort of uh, New York City subway car. And, you know, it looks great. This is a prime example of, you know, the, the kind of capabilities of the Unreal Engine in terms of, you know, the quality of rendering. You can really end up with these super detailed, high definition um, scenes and models and things like that, because of course it is used for video games um, and, you know, kind of is harnessing that sort of technology. So we're going to be controlling these overhead lights. And if we look in our outliner on the right, we can kind of scroll down. We've got folders containing each different, uh, you know, type of object that's in this scene. And you'll notice that there is a section here called lights. So this is really what we're going to be working in for this project uh, mostly. Uh, so we've got these ceiling lights here. As you can see, we've got a, a number of them. And you'll notice on the right, we have this type column. So for a lot of these, we have, you know, spotlight, uh, point light. But for these ceiling lights, they actually have what's called a blueprint. And that is basically a, a almost like a class uh, of object that has a number of objects combined together, in this case, a mesh and a couple of lights um, so that we have this sort of compound object. So we're going to actually edit the, um, the blueprint for that light in a moment. First, however, we're going to start by creating a blueprint of our own to receive the messages, the OSC messages that are coming from Touch Designer, and then we're going to take those and uh, map them to these lights. So we're going to head down to the content browser in the bottom, and you'll see here we have this subway train folder. I'm just going to use the kind of folder hierarchy that's already here. Uh, we've got blueprints right here on the left. So I'll click that. And you can see here, here are all the blueprints that are 
uh, currently existing in this project. And right here, the overhead light, that is the one that we can see uh, we've made many copies of in this scene for this, this overhead lighting in the subway car. So we'll be coming back to that one later. But what we're going to do for now is to right click in the background here and then click on Create Basic Asset Blueprint Class. So you'll end up with this window which gives you a number of different options and what I'm going to do here is to click Actor. So this is an object that can be placed or spawned in the world um, and that is actually what we're going to use for our OSC. So um, I've added that and you can see here's our new blueprint down below. Uh, there's kind of this naming convention that we can see here where we use capital BP to denote that this is a blueprint. So I'm going to type BP and then underscore um, TD underscore OSC underscore in. So I know that that is my OSC receiver um, grabbing information from Touch Designer. So there we go, we've got that all ready to go. Before we start to edit this blueprint, one thing that we also have to do is to check that we have the OSC plugin enabled in this project. So you'll click this little settings icon in the upper right and then click on plugins where you'll then uh, see this window which shows all the different plugins available uh, on your machine. I'll type in OSC and you can see here we have one OSC Open Sound Control which is made by Epic Games. It is not currently enabled so what I'm going to do is click the little toggle here and then it will tell us that we have to restart Unreal Editor for the changes to take effect. So go ahead and restart that now and then we'll meet back here and edit the blueprint. So once you've restarted Unreal Engine uh, that plugin should be enabled and you can always confirm that by clicking the little settings icon again Again, heading to plugins and typing in OSC and double checking that the check mark here is enabled. Once you've done that, we can now open and edit our blueprint for the OSC receiver. So I'm going to double click on that blueprint and you'll notice that if you've, if you've opened the blueprint uh, editor window before, this looks a little bit different. All we have to do is to click the open full blueprint editor link and we should see the normal blueprint editor. When you first enter this, you should see probably the viewport like this. We're not going to worry about any of this 3D functionality because we're not going to be using it for this particular blueprint. So we're gonna to head to the event graph, which is where we can do our node editing. We're actually going to pull in some functionality from the documentation because it contains a lot of the operators that we would be adding to this network anyway. So the easiest way to access the documentation for Unreal is to hit the F1 key on your keyboard, which will automatically bring it up in your web browser. If that, for whatever reason, doesn't work on your machine, go ahead and open up your browser and head to docs.unrealengine.com. Once there, we're going to search the documentation in the upper right for OSC and hit enter. And then after that loads, you'll see we have this OSC plugin overview for Unreal Engine. We're gonna click on that. This is the page that we should now be at. And if we scroll down, we can see here the OSC plugin must be enabled. So there we go, we've already done that. And we'll keep on scrolling, this is all good documentation uh, for understanding how this works. But you'll notice here that we have a couple of node graphs that are showing us an example uh, setup for receiving OSC messages. This second one here, binding an event to all messages, is what we're going to use for our particular example today. So thankfully, we can actually copy all of this rather than having to uh, build this out piece by piece. So what I'm gonna do is click this copy node graph link, which will bring up this little pop-up. I'm gonna hit control C to copy, and then I'll head back to Unreal and paste it. Now that we're back in Unreal, I can just kind of move to an empty area of my network and hit control V to paste that into the network. And there we go, we have the exact same set of nodes that were in that example. One thing to note is that if you have not enabled OSC uh, via that plugin menu, some of these operators won't paste in uh, correctly because they are not enabled. So you'll see uh, 
probably many fewer operators than we're, we're looking at now. So if you're running into that, just go ahead and double check that on your machine. So we have our network here, which basically creates an OSC server and then is binding an event uh, to that um, OSC message being received. And we've created a custom event, um, which will basically get the address from that OSC message, convert that to a string, grab the particular message that goes along with the address. And then in this case, it will just print it out to our screen and to the log. So this is a, just a great tool for uh, kind of testing that that connectivity works. And what we're going to do to begin is we're gonna modify this a little bit just so that we can have uh, some settings available to us back in the kind of main screen of uh, our Unreal editor. So I'm gonna increase the size of this a little bit. And then what we're going to do is grab the event begin play node down here and move it up because this is going to be the node that we're using to um, start executing our uh, OSC server in this chain of nodes. So what I'm going to do here is drag off of this execute pin and connect it to the first input of this OSC server. What this means is that when I click this play button here or back in the editor, I will uh, basically execute all of the nodes that are connected to this. So that is uh, great. That will allow our functionality to start working. But another kind of core component here is the ability for us to set an IP address, set a port, and we also need to define a server name um, just as kind of a good measure for this to function correctly. So first of all, the IP address is something that could potentially change from machine to machine um, or that you'd want the ability to change without having to head into this editor. So we're going to promote this to a variable. So I'm going to right click on that and hit promote to variable and you'll see over on the right, we now have a new node that says receive IP address. And then over here in this variable section of our blueprint, we have this new variable added receive IP address, and it is a string. So um, let's go ahead and add the port in the same way. So I'll right click on the port and hit promote to variable, move this node down. For both of these, we want these to be modifiable outside of this window. So we want to turn this uh, into a public variable by clicking this little eye icon to the right. So make sure both of those eyes are open. And that again, will set that variable to be public and editable. And then for the server name, we don't actually need that to be editable outside of this particular instance. We just want to make sure that we've set that to something. So I'm gonna call this UE for Unreal Engine and then underscore OSC. So great, we've got those things set up. Another kind of best practice here is to set up a uh, variable to store this information associated with this OSC server in uh, because there are certain situations where we might start our scene and the OSC server uh, might get uh, deleted or or uh, disabled as a part of the garbage cleanup that happens at uh, at play. So I'm going to click on this variable section here. I'm going to click the plus sign on the right, and this is going to be our um, td underscore osc server. I guess really we could just call it osc server. Doesn't matter. Um, and then I want to change this from a boolean data type to a OSC, we're going to type that in here. Uh, we want this to be an OSC server uh, object type. And we are going to make an object reference um, for that particular object type. So I'm going to click that and we've got that there. And we're going to then drag this out into our network and say, set the TDOSC server as a variable. 
From there, I'm going to disconnect these two cables by alt clicking on them. And then I'm going to drag the execute pin to the input and the return value to the second input here. Then I'm going to do the same from the output to the uh, bind node to the right. And with that, we have now set, or we will set the uh, OSC, TDOSC server variable when we create that OSC server and avoid this situation where it is basically shut off after we start our uh, playback. So from there, uh, we have something that can receive the messages, but we want to make sure that we um, actually can print these to our screen. So if we look back in Touch Designer for a second, you'll notice that although it looks like we're sending out integers sometimes, we also have some float values coming out of our uh, OSC uh, data stream here, and our numeric format here is set to float 32-bit. So if we head back to our Blueprint Editor, you can see that this is actually looking for an OSC message integer. So that means basically it will not print the message to our screen correctly because it is looking for an integer message and not a float message. So what can we do? We can replace this with another operator. So I'm just going to right click in an empty area here and we want to get uh, OSC float message at index. So we're going to type that in here and click get OSC message float at index. And then we're basically going to reconnect uh, the uh, couple of connections that we've got here from the OSC message integer node. So first of all, the execute pin, I'm going to connect that. And then I want to connect this message input. Um, and then here, now I can delete this integer node. This here is expecting an integer as well. So we want to make sure that we delete that. And then we'll move this node down. Now we can take that execute pin and connect it to the print string over here on the right. And then the actual value of this OSC message will connect to this input D of our append node to the right. You'll notice that that automatically has done this conversion between the output here, which is a float to a string so that we can then print it to the screen. So assuming that we've got all of that good stuff set up, what we can now do is compile and save. And then we can close this window and head back to the editor. So now we can go ahead and test whether or not our OSC connection is functional with that network that we've just set up. So what I'm going to do here is to now click and drag this BP TDOSC in um, actor into the scene. I'll just drop it anywhere. It's not going to render in the final uh, display because there's no uh, 3D objects associated with it. And then I can go ahead and hit the little play icon up here. And what we should see if it were functioning is that it would then start printing out on the left side of the screen. It's not doing that yet because we haven't yet set the correct um, IP address or the port that we should be looking at to get those messages from Touch Designer. So I'll hit escape on the keyboard to um, stop our uh, preview there. And then what we'll see on the right is that our blueprint that we've just added should be highlighted in our outliner. If it's not, you'll probably have to scroll all the way to the bottom to find it. And there it is. Um, and you'll notice here, if we look at the details for this particular blueprint, we have those two parameters available to us that we made public. So here is our receive IP address. And because I've set this up on my local machine, and you'll likely have done the same, we're going to set this receive IP address to 127.0.0.1. Then for the port, uh, if you go back to Touch Designer, you should see that that is set to 10,000 by default. If you've changed that setting, uh, make sure that whatever port number you are setting here matches your OSC out chop in Touch Designer. Once we do that, we should then be able to click play 
and we should see on the right our intensity uh, message is coming through and then on the right here that is the value of that message. So the connection is now functional but we have to then take it and do something with it. So let's go ahead and hit escape again to pause our uh, playback there and we can head back into the blueprint we just created to continue on with our uh, network of nodes. So we have a system basically that will print any message that comes through and uh, what we really want is to be able to filter these messages so that we can take the correct message for the intensity level and then apply it to the lights. So the first thing that I'm gonna do here before we actually get this message, uh, the OSC message float, I am going to set up the ability to test uh, what the actual OSC address string is. And if it is intensity, then I will get the message float for that particular message. So um, I'm gonna leave the printing stuff here for now, just so we can keep kind of testing. We'll probably uh, delete that later on, but I am going to take everything from that part of the network and kind of scoot it over to the right. And then I'm going to um, move or uh, expand this comment a little bit more. So um, here we go, we've got some space. And what we can do is right click on an empty area and then we want to type in wildcard. You'll notice then we have this uh, string function called matches wildcard. And we can click that and add it to the network. And we have this handy little function. So if we plug in this full path output, so we'll connect that pin to this input pin, we can test this string that is coming in against a wildcard that we set up ourselves. So what I'm gonna do here is we know that the channel that we're looking for is going to be called, or the address rather, is going to be called um, intensity. So we can do forward slash intensity and make sure to spell that correctly. And if it matches, we will get a Boolean output, um, which we can then take and trigger some functionality with. So I might even scoot these over just a little bit more, just because I know that we have one more node to add. Oops, so go ahead and do that as well. And then we'll expand this again. Okay, so we've got a return value coming out of this that is a Boolean. What we're gonna do here is drag off of that return value and we'll add a branch node to um, take that condition and give us a, a true or a false execute pin. So first of all, I need to connect an execute pin to the input um, and then if this condition that we receive from the wildcard uh, matches wildcard function is true, we want to then grab the OSC message float at index and do all of this stuff after that. So I'm going to take the output from the true pin and connect it to the rest of the network. So with that small addition, we can then compile and save and close and then click play again. And what we see on the right should be exactly the same. However, one thing that you might have noticed is that before we should have had an additional message if we look in our log, we used to have another channel coming in called sample rate, uh, which is just something that is sent from touch designer by uh, default and now that we have filtered the messages selectively and are only printing if we have the uh, matching intensity address, we don't see those sample rate channels anymore. So we're just kind of setting it up this way so that if you were to continue adding channels, you could then filter them out and uh, wouldn't be stuck with having to route or deal with messages being sent to the wrong place. So I'm gonna close the log and then we'll head back to our blueprint once again. So here we are back in our blueprint editor and uh, 
we have been printing thus far the information to the screen, but we actually want to take this data and route it to the intensity level of our lighting rather than just seeing what the output is. So basically we need to add some additional functionality to the network to do that. First of all, uh, one important thing that we have to do is to tell this uh, node graph that we have set up, this functionality, which nodes we want to be adjusting. And so we'll use a variable to access those uh, particular nodes. So what I'm going to do here is add a new variable by clicking the plus sign. And then this is going to be called our blueprint. And then I'll call this overhead underscore light. Um, that is just a reference that this will be referencing the uh, particular class of blueprint with the overhead lighting in it. So I don't want this to be a Boolean. I want this to be a blueprint. So uh, the blueprint type, oops, let me type that right, overhead light. So, okay, here it's actually all one word. Uh, it doesn't really matter as long as we kind of understand what this is referencing. So we want to reference this particular class of object because we are in our scene, if we go back for a moment, we have a ton of these overhead lights added to our lighting section. Keep scrolling, keep scrolling, here we go. So all of these ceiling light objects are actually the exact same type of blueprint and we can use that to our advantage uh, because they will have the same blueprint class associated with them. Uh, we can sort of think of it like an instance of that class and we can then reference all of the objects in the scene that have that particular class and make modifications to them from there. So let's again go back to the editor and we're going to use this, um, this BP overhead light um, variable to reference those objects. So again, for the type of the, um, the variable that we've set up, you should type in overhead light and you should see under object types BP overhead light 01, you don't want the object reference, you want the class reference instead. Okay, so we've got that in our variables. Let's go ahead and drag that onto the network. And we want to get the BP overhead light variable. Cool, so there is our new little node. We're going to drag off of this one as well. And then we're going to get um, all actors of this particular class. So we have the ability to specify a class of actor, which we've done here, and we can then trigger this uh, function to execute and it will give us an array of all of the actors in our scene that have that particular class. Now this is not necessarily the most, um, the most ideal in terms of performance, especially if you had a ton of different operators or uh, actors rather of this class in the scene, but we don't have that many. So in our case, it should be totally fine. So what I'm gonna do here is connect the execute pin to the input, and then we have the ability to um, take this, this output of uh, this particular type of operator and use that as the reference to the operators that we want to manipulate. Now we won't be able to adjust the intensity of the lighting just yet because we are going to have to set up some custom functionality within that blueprint to do so. So I'm going to first of all compile and save and then I'll minimize this for a moment because now we're actually gonna have to edit the overhead light uh, blueprint in our scene as well. So I'm going to double click on that. And what we should see, if we click over to the viewport section, there is the overhead light. And if we look in the components section, we can see this is actually made up of a number of different things. We actually have uh, a, a mesh, and then we have point light, a spotlight, and a 
God Ray plane. So what I'm going to do is to adjust the intensity of this point light object specifically. So to do that, we're going to set up a, uh, a custom event or some custom functionality in the event graph. So let's head over there. And here we are in the editor. We can then add a custom event. So here we go, add custom event. And this is going to be called, I'm gonna call this set intensity. So this custom event is going to allow us to set the intensity of our point light. Now for this event, um, we want to be able to send in a value, a float value specifically to set the point light intensity. We need to, you know, give it a number to actually change that value. So over here in the right in the details panel, I'll click the plus sign under inputs and we have this new parameter pop up. So this is going to be our intensity. So I'm just going to type that in intensity and we don't want a boolean we want a float so i'm going to set that to float and there we go we've got our custom event uh, ready to roll now what i can do is to drag off of the intensity and we can actually pull up if we type in set intensity we have a built-in function for these uh, point lights called set intensity. So in this case, I've clicked that and it has added it to the network and it also has given us a target for the point light that we want to adjust. So that is it for this uh, little piece of functionality here. The next step is to click on the point light object over in our components. And we want to change the mobility option here. So if we mouse over the static setting, we can see that it says a static light can't be changed in game. So that means the lighting is called fully baked lighting, uh, which is intended for fast rendering, which means that we can't adjust the intensity once we are uh, you know, within the game. So what we want to do in this case is to set our mode to either stationary or to movable. Now, if we set it to stationary, we're going to have a uh, situation where the, um, the lights will have a, uh, uh, some overlap with one another and we'll end up with some errors. And so in this case, I'm just going to set it to movable. So um, that is about it for this particular blueprint. And I'm going to hit compile and save. And then we need to go back to our TD OSCN blueprint and continue on with the functionality here. So we have started, uh, you know, but not finished our setting of our intensity value. So first of all, um, let's go ahead and drag off from the execute pin. Now make sure that you are clicking and dragging off of the execute pin specifically because you won't be able to access this functionality elsewhere. So what I want to do is then type in set intensity and we should see that custom event show up that we created back in the overhead light. So I'm going to click that and there we go. We've got that function. We can then co connect the out actors array to the target input. So it'll use all of the different actors that are of this particular class in our scene and run this function for each one of those actors. Then we also need to set a intensity float value. So we're going to head back to our OSC message float at index um, node here and click and drag off of the value pin to the intensity pin. The last thing that we need to do here is to make sure that we're actually referencing something in our BP overhead light class reference. Right now, its default value is set to none. And so it basically will result in us having no uh, changes appearing in our scene. However, we can then click the drop down here and reference BP overhead light one, which again, that's the blueprint for the lighting. 
We'll click that and now that reference is being correctly made. So we can then hit compile and save and then take a look at our scene. So you may need to rebuild your lighting and if you have an error over here telling you to do so, you can always click the build, build lighting only option, uh, which I will do now. That'll take maybe 30 seconds or so. So we'll join back together once that is complete. Okay, so I have rebuilt my lighting and now hopefully when I click play, we should see that our lights are now oscillating on and off based on those OSC messages. So we have successfully completed the kind of main goal of this tutorial, but we have some other finessing that we're going to look at doing now just to kind of take things to the next level. So I'm gonna hit the stop button here. And um, the first thing that we'll notice is that when I changed those, um, those point lights from static to movable, and maybe this was the case beforehand, they appear to have rotated. So we have this light kind of coming out of nothing in the ceiling instead of uh, uh, appearing from inside of this mesh. So unfortunately, we're gonna have to go through and reset the positioning of those uh, different components, but thankfully it's not very difficult to do so. So we're just gonna have to go through each one of these ceiling light objects and then um, this is pretty cramped, so let me see if I can move this up a little bit. So for each one of these, we have our point light. And so I'm gonna click first on the ceiling light that I wanna reference, and then the point light within that ceiling light uh, blueprint. And then I can actually reset the rotation value here by clicking this arrow. You can't really see it, but way at the end there, it is now reset the rotation. So I'm just gonna go through and do that for each one of the ones within our scene. And once that is complete, we should have lighting that looks a little bit more normal. After that, we're going to head back into our um, blueprint for the OSC uh, functionality and we're going to remove the printing of our variables or our, our messages rather because we um, now have kind of confirmed that everything is functioning like it should. So there we go that took you know a little bit of time but uh, looks better now that we've got that all set up and uh, I'm going to go ahead and save just to uh, make sure that I'm not gonna lose any of these changes. Now let's head back into the OSCN blueprint. And first of all, let's, let's start by deleting the print string append and this conversion here. And we've got a little bit more space in our network now, so I'm gonna scoot this uh, back over and you'll notice that when I deleted that, I also lost the connection of the execute pin. Now that's okay because we're actually going to add some additional functionality here. So I'm going to move the uh, get all actors of class function up along with the overhead light function. Now we are not going to be dynamically creating or removing at any point the uh, overhead lighting. So it really doesn't make sense to continuously call this get all actors of class function throughout the scene every time that we are uh, receiving an OSC message. So what I think I'll do instead is drag over from the execute pin that is connected to the event begin play uh, function instead. And that way it will only call this function at the beginning of the scene instead of over and over and over. So I'll connect the pin to that execute input and then I still do want the set intensity function to be calculated when uh, we are receiving the OSC message. So I will connect the output of the OSC message float at index uh, execute pin to that input there. And then I'll alt click on the one connected from get all actors of class to remove that connection. Now you might've noticed in the beginning that 
we had lights that were all different colors. And although that is not something that was connected to Touch Designer, it is something that's fairly easy to set up. And so just so that you can have some practice working with the uh, node event graph system here, we're going to run through that really quick before we kind of close out. So I'm gonna compile and save again. And then I'm gonna head back to the overhead light. So for this one, I'm going to um, add an additional custom event, just like before. And this one is going to set a random color for the lights. So I'm gonna call it set random color. Again, that's a custom event. And in this case, we're not going to be providing any information to this uh, custom event. We're not going to be sending a float value or anything in like that. We just want it to trigger um, the setting of the color for that point light. So to do that, um, what we need to do is to set, um, first of all, we need to basically generate RGB values for that uh, color, and then we need to set the light color accordingly. So I'm gonna drag off the pin over to the right, and then we'll type in set color. And you'll see we have a number of options. We want to set light color for a point light. And you'll notice here that we have uh, added another point light reference just like before. So I'll just move that over here and move our light color uh, function over as well. Now, um, these could be connected to the same uh, point light node, but it shouldn't matter in this case. And for the light color section, what I'm going to do is to um, split this out into multiple float values. So I'll right click on this parameter, or this pin rather, and I'm going to split that struct pin so that we have RGB and alpha values accessible independently. So those are float values that we should be receiving. And um, we're not going to set up anything for the alpha because we're not going to be dealing with transparency. So what I can then do is to generate a random float. So I'm just gonna use the random float function here. And I'm gonna make three of those. So we can do it just like that. And this will automatically um, return a float value between 0 and 1, which is perfect because the RGB color values should be in that range. So I'll connect then each one of these to the RGB color um, pins. Once we've done that, we can then compile and save, head back to TDOSCN, and we can use this same um, the same on play or begin play event to trigger the generation of uh, random colors for each one of our um, different overhead lights. So let's go ahead and do that now. So what I'm going to do is to um, drag off of the execute pin, just like before, of the get all actors of class. And then I will type in set random. And there we go, there's our custom event, set random color. I'll click that. And again, just like with the set intensity, we need a target. And we want to use the get all actors of class array as the target there. So with that, we should be able to then compile, save, and head back to our uh, main editor window here. I'll hit save, and hopefully, if we hit play, we should then see all of our lights have a slightly different color applied to them, which won't change over time, but every time that we hit the play button, we'll get a different combination of colors applied to those lights. So although um, that is not being triggered by anything in Touch Designer, it is there to show you that you could then continue our kind of message parsing system and use those values to then change the colors of the lights that we have set up.
So that is everything for the scope of this tutorial. Uh, one thing, one quick thing that I wanted to mention since, you know, we haven't really looked at Touch Designer a whole lot in this process is that you can then, you know, build out much more complex triggering functionality in Touch Designer to say, synchronize the control of that lighting with the BPM of a song or actually using the audio signal of that song to control something like the lighting in the scene. You can do other things like setting position values of uh, different objects in your scene. And as you can see, the, the uh, event graph really has some very, very complex possibilities available for what you can do with the OSC control in Unreal. So um, I would highly recommend playing around with the uh, nodes that you're working with to generate these chop channels in Touch Designer, as well as the, um, the way that you're applying those OSC messages in Unreal. So just as a quick example, I'm just going to set this to the square mode, perhaps, which will give us this on off uh, animation. And then we can head back to Unreal. And there we go. We already have a different look than before. But again, like I was saying, this could be synced to a uh, song or audio trigger or anything that you want it to be. This really only scratches the surface of what is possible with this sort of connectivity. But I hope that you're now uh, going to take what you've learned here and expand on it for yourself. So with that, I uh, hope you have enjoyed putting this together. Looking forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks so much for watching. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're serious about taking your touch designer and interactive skills to the next level, I highly recommend you check out the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can learn more by checking out the link in the description. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon for more awesome free content.